Hi, I'm Ian LaVanzant, and I'm in the DC Spotlight. And when they told me that my mother died of breast cancer, I said immediately, I'm not going out like that. I'm not going out like that. I forgot to say, and neither are my children. So when Jamia had this rare form of colon cancer that we can't trace anywhere in our family line, her line, her father's line, or my line, I knew, I said, something bigger than this is going on. Because see, what I know from a spiritual nature is she took this affliction in the family line so that I wouldn't have to. I'm real clear about that. And to put an end to it in our family line so that not only the physical dis-ease, but the emotional, the spiritual, the psychological dis-ease because my mother's mother died. My mother died. You understand? I lived, but then my daughter dies, and all of them left daughters. So one of the things that I looked at in writing Peace from Broken Pieces were the pathologies and the patterns of belief and behavior experience that go on in our families. We don't look at that. You know, we look at, oh, I have eyes like my grandmother, ears like my uncle. Oh, but you got a temper like your great-great-grandmother. <laughs> but you also have the courage and the tenacity like your great-great-grandmother who picked cotton in the field or laid in the bottom of a boat or avoided the gas chamber. You understand? You have that too. How come we don't look at that? So we have cellular memory. We have ancestral predilections that we act out in our life, whether it's about relationships. You know, my mother was the other woman. I was in a 40-year relationship. For 10 years, I was the other woman. I didn't even know my mother and ended up doing that. I was a class of study classical ballet for 23 years. My mother was a phenomenal dancer. Didn't know it. Never knew it. You understand? So I looked at that, and that's really what peace from Broken Pieces is really about for me because the inability for me to heal the loneliness. Because a childless, a motherless child is a lonely person. I could never explain it. I thought it was I needed a better relationship, another job, more shoes, whatever. I miss my mother. You know, because I knew her. She died when I was three. Um, never feeling that I had done quite enough. 15 books in 11 years. Come on, that's crazy. You know, two in one year. Uh, and, and good at what I do, excellent at what I do, and always looking for how to do better. Never feeling quite good enough. Still, you know, able to move and get up, tie my shoes and spell my name. But when, I, when Jamia died, I really was able to get down in the core of the cooties that were down in there, you know. The work that I've been doing at Inner Visions for 16 years, helping other people do it and using their, their lessons, uh, and Jamia and I built Inner Visions together. So I said all of that to say, look beyond this physical thing for yourself. Look at your patterns of thinking, your patterns of belief, your patterns of behavior, and understand, like I said before, that God knows who you are, where you are, and God knows what you know. So whatever comes up in your life is coming up to stir up some knowledge in you, you know, stir up some knowledge in you. So one of the things that we do, I do at Inner Visions is twice a year I do something called a Wonder Woman Weekend where I help women stir up that knowledge over the course of a weekend. And this, uh, several years ago we started doing a program, Women's Rites of Passage. Because one of the things that I've learned, both from my Native American heritage and my African heritage, my Yoruba heritage, is that this whole notion of rites of passage is very important, absolutely essential, and particularly for us as women, that each of our ages, our teens, our 20s, our 30s, our 40s, our 50s, brings us into a new level of maturation. And each, less, each age has a lesson, a blessing, a power, a healing that we must master. And if we don't master it, we'll carry this unfinished business into the next age. So many of us are 20 acting 50, 
or 50 acting 30. <laughs> you understand? Although 60 is the new 40, I'm so yes. <laughs> The closer I get to it, the better it looks. Yeah. So, but we have unhealed stuff that we act out, we eat out, <coughs> we shop out, we beat our men up about, that's you, boo, it ain't him, it's you. Leave him alone, clean your stuff up, and he will either shift with you or go away. Um, so we do this six weeks rites of passage program because it's such a joy for me to share with women that which I've learned. Not made up, not think about, but learned. Um, because I'm not healed until all of us are healed. You know? And when I look at our young women today, our 20 year olds, I say, ooh, I got a lot of healing to do. Oh, yes. I'm very sick. <laughs> look, you have been missed. You have been missed. You are definitely <laughs> have been missed. Okay. Thank I'm you. gonna let you I'm gonna let this the floor is yours. Okay. The floor is yours. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna can... sign books. Yeah. That's what I have to do so okay. that I can leave. Okay. Now, no, now wait a minute, let me just say this because that wouldn't be fair. Does anybody have a question? Do you have a question? I have yeah. How does it? Okay. No, that's a never, never. You have a voice. You use it. What happened was about um, I was thirty. Yeah. So I don't know how many years ago. Thirty years ago. Ooh, that sounds like frightening to say. <laughs> oh my God. My. You know how when you're growing up, and particularly for us in the African American community, everybody's your cousin and your aunt, right? So you really don't know who you're related to. Like this is aunt so and so, and we. So you don't ask. You don't ask, right? You just assume this is cousin and the aunt and everything. So anyway, I had aunt Alma, aunt Lizzie, aunt Dora, and I didn't know who these people were. And so um, then all of a sudden they were all gone. They weren't around, and you know. I really am spiritually grounded, and I had a dream that said to me I had to find Aunt Alma. I didn't know who Aunt Alma. I knew who she was when I was a kid. I had never seen her in my in my adult life. So anyway, um, in 1984, my father committed suicide. He was a master herbalist, and uh, he went in the park and picked herbs and made a concoction and killed himself. And um, he had myself and my brother with my mom, and he had five other children with another woman. And I was the only one he left a note to. He wrote me a note, and he left me his note. And in this dream, I was reading this note. So anyway, this was pre-internet, you know. Uh, I had this dream that I needed to go find Aunt Alma, and so I did something that we don't no longer do. I called 411. <laughs> Now we Google it, right? <laughs> so I get on the phone and I call 411 and I, I, Alma Jefferson, that's all I knew. And I call Washington because I remember she lived in Washington on Florida Avenue. The trolley used to run by there because we spent the summers down there. And she was listed. Go figure. So I called her and I got in my car and I drove down here. I was still living in New York at the time. And she told me. She told me who she was. She told me she was my mother's sister. And she told me all about my mother and my father's relationship. She told me that my mother was an alcoholic, which I didn't know. She told me that my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer when she was pregnant with me, which I didn't know. She told me that my, when my mother died, that my father, who was a street number runner, uh, that they, nobody had any money, so she was buried in Potter's Field. And she gave me a picture of my mother, who looked just like Jamia. Exactly, Jamia was her spitting image. And she told me all the stories about the family and this and that and the other thing. And we had cookies and tea together. And she lived on, she lived on Florida Avenue. And so I went home and I told her I had to, uh, I think I was in school at the time. Yeah, I think I was finishing up law school. And I went to, I don't remember, but anyway, this is what happened. Three weeks later I called, the number was disconnected. And um, she told me she was moving and she'd get back to me and get me her new number. And she told me about my other Aunt Lizzie. And she told me who Aunt Lizzie was. And Lizzie was still living in Brooklyn on something. I called Aunt Lizzie and spoke to her on the phone. And she told me that Aunt Alma, they had buried her the, month, the past Monday. She stayed alive long enough to give me the information that I needed. That's 
So um, that's how I found out. My auntie told me, and she really was my auntie. Is that good? Good. What else? Yes. How is your granddaughter doing? <gasps> <Yeah>. <laughs> how old is she now? Sixteen. <laughs> she is sixteen, but it's really challenging learning to mother, grandmother, because I'm mothering in the midst of my life. So she's in a wonderful boarding school up in Baltimore County. Now let me tell you this story real quickly. Jamia always planned how Neil Mojo was going to be educated. We knew early on she was not she was going to go to a private boarding school because we were I, as an educator we just had no respect for the public school system and so um after jamia passed she ended up staying with her father for four years he put her in a public school and uh she was catatonically depressed and he said uh the school psychologist told him she was doing well I said, well, I want her name because she needs to be fine. <laughs> How can a child who loses their mother be doing well? What the, that don't even smell right. Do that smell right? That doesn't even smell right. So anyway, I had to end up taking him to court. I got custody of her. So when you read Peace from Broken Pieces, the back is actually the front. The book is not in order. It's out of context. Because she had an encounter with her father where I prepared her and talked to her and encouraged her to stand up to him and ask for what she wanted, which was not something anybody ever taught me how to do. But I knew that if her mother had died, if her mother had left her body to clean up our family, then she, Niamoja, my granddaughter, was not going to experience any of the stuff that I experienced. So she had this encounter with her dad, and I knew that I had to be for her who no one had been for me. So I encourage her to have a voice, to have an opinion. I encourage her, to, like, she loves her body. She's got my boobs, which were huge at one point in time. She's got, <laughs> she's got her mom's legs, which are thick and big. And she's got, uh, you know, full hot and tot bottom that comes from where we come from. And five pounds of hair on her head, which, you know. But I've taught her about herself and her body. So when she got ready, when I finally got custody of her four years down, and, and um, we, I said, how would you like to go to boarding school? She said, I would love that. She wanted to go to boarding school. And uh, we, I said, well, where do you want to go? Well, I don't want to go too far, she said, because I need to come home on the weekend. <laughs> so we found this lovely school up in um, Baltimore County. The thing that really fried my brain was she got online. She found it. She said she wanted to go see it. And it was the same school Jamia had picked for her when she was seven months old. <laughs> St. Timothy's Girls School in Baltimore County. Jamea had the pictures, she had the, the um, brochure, she had everything that she had picked. That was one of a few that she had looked at when Jamea was seven months, when Neomoja was seven months old. So she's 16 years old now, she's a total diva. I really am glad she's in boarding school so she's learning to grow up and I don't spoil her because I would be feeling sorry for her because she doesn't have a mother and I would give her everything and and I would, I, you know, I, she would be my pimp, basically. <laughs> and I would be very happy about it. Uh, so she's in boarding school, very mature. She um, is now planning. She's, her name is now Neomoja Morgan Van Zandt VSN, VNS. And the VNS on the end of her name stands for Vassar's Newest Student. <laughs> Because she wants to go to Vassar and study, get this, peace studies. So that she can be prepared to do international conflict resolution. Somebody talk to me. Okay. International conflict resolution, peace studies. So we went to Vassar last week and to visit. She's in the 11th grade, she'll be in the 12th grade. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's really, it's amazing to parent when you're awake when you're conscious, you know. Um, it's, it's an amazing experience. Like we have conversations and, and she'll say, well, what should I do? Well, what, choose, make a choice. What does it feel like in your gut? I don't have anything in my gut right now. Well, don't choose till you get something. This is how I talk to her, <laughs> you know. And she'll ask questions. And then she's got 55 mothers at InterVisions, you know, we all take care of her. So it's been great. Yeah.